Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored and proud to introduce the Euro plenary speaker for the year 2010. Professor Harold William Kuhn is so famous that even presenting him could appear superfluous. I'm sure that anybody in this room has been studying some of his fundamental results during the university years maybe in various courses. Indeed, uh, the research activity of Professor Kuhn spans several fields, uh, not only combinatorial optimization, where the Hungarian algorithm uh, is regarded as one of the milestones, or nonlinear programming, where a basic result are the Kuhn-Tucker conditions, but also algebra, where he gave uh, in an elementary proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra and game theory where is developed a representation of extensive games uh, as trees. Born in California in 1925, Professor Kuhn was drafted very young at age 19 into the army where he served two years uh, taking part to the specialized training program in Japanese. Discharged for the army in 1946, uh, he completed his studies uh, and got his PhD at Princeton University, where he met uh, his uh, lifelong friend and colleague, uh, John Forbes Nash. For some year after the PhD, he was active in Europe, especially in Paris, London, and in Rome, before returning to Princeton, where he then spent most of his teaching and research career, and where he is today Professor Emeritus of Mathematics. In 1949, sorry, he organized the, the mother of all uh, mathematical programming conferences. The celebrated Chicago Mathematical Programming Conference number zero. Later on, he has been president of SIAM, secretary of the Division of Mathematics of the National Academy of Sciences, and one of the founders of the Research Society Mathematica. In 1980, Professor Kuhn has been awarded the John von Neumann Theory Prize. It is time to stop speaking of Professor Kuhn and start listening to him. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure we will all enjoy his lecture on one of his favorite children, the Hungarian algorithm for the assignment problem. Professor Kuhn. Thank you, Professor Martello, for your kind introduction. I'd like to also thank Professor Paishan for his uh, cordial and helpful uh, introduction to Lisbon, a marvelous city. I'm going to tell you a story in the next hour. It's a tale of four mathematicians who worked on the same problem but in very different historical periods. First of all, we have at the top of this slide Carl uh, Gustav Jacob Jacobi, who was active during the reign of the Prussian monarchs in the first half of the 18th century. Then we have Danis Koenig and Jeno Egavari who did their research in Hungary in the first half of the, 19th, of the 20th century, when it was governed by Admiral Horty, the Germans, and the Russians. And last, myself, who started my career in post-war United States during the period of Eisenhower, Nixon, and McCarthyism. These four mathematicians are connected by one problem and an algorithm called the Hungarian method, which solves the mathematical pro problem that's known in operations research as the linear assignment problem. 
Our tale begins in 1953, and it will move forward and backward in time. I spent the summer of 1953 at the Institute for Numerical Analysis at the University of California in Los Angeles. Although I was supported by the National Bureau of Standards, I had no fixed duties that summer and spent most of the summer working on the traveling salesman problem and the assignment problem. It's important to establish the historical context of this work. Linear programming was only about five years old. And in the summer of 1948, David Gale, Al Tucker, and myself formed a project to study the relationship between linear programming and zero-sum two-person games. An important side product of this project was the first rigorous proof of the duality theorem for linear programming. In the summer of 1950, Tucker and myself presented the first paper on nonlinear programming. Although the simplex method was being programmed for the new electronic computers of the day, the possibility of special algorithms for special problems like the assignment problem seemed to be a real possibility and opportunity. Happily, there's a splendid new book that gives a detailed history of the sources of the assignment problem. You can see that one of the co-authors is the chairman of this session. He didn't pay me to put this plug in here. <laughs> but I'll give you the full details. It was published by Siam last year, and you'll find it a great book. It gives a detailed history of the origins of the assignment problem and its subsequent development. That allows me to give a very condensed treatment of the problem here. It can be stated very simply as follows. I'm glad I'm controlling the computer myself. What is the assignment problem? Well, in the form I want to discuss today, the data are a square, are the entries of a square matrix. We we'll call them Rij. And then the problem is to find n entries, one in each row and column, no two in the same row or column, such that the sum of the entries is a maximum for over all such assignments. A natural interpretation is. Rij is the rating of individual i in job j, and we want to maximize the total rating sum. Why is it a linear program? <clears throat> well, first of all, we can represent the assignment by matrices which are known as permutation matrices, using 0 or 1. A 1, if you're going to assign the entry in ij, you'll find a 1 in position ij. I've given you an example of such a permutation matrix for n equal 3. 1, 1 in each row and column, the rest zeros. Geometrically, these matrices are points in an n squared dimensional space. And since our object is to maximize a linear function, the rating sum, we get the same answer if we maximize over the assignments or if we maximize over the convex hull of these permutation matrices in n squared space. And here we're helped by a theorem which nobody credits to Koenig, but he really did it. It's always credited to uh, Garrett Burkhoff in a paper of 1946 but it's really implicit in the work of Koenig himself. The theorem says the convex hull of the permutation matrix is very simple to describe. They are the doubly stochastic matrices, matrices with non-negative 
entries and row sums one and column sums one. So this allows us to state very easily the linear program which is equivalent to the assignment problem. This problem is maximize the sum of Rij times Xij over all i and j, subject to the constraints that every Xij is a non-negative number, and the sum on i for each j is 1, and the sum on j for each i is 1. That is, maximize the rating sum over the doubly stochastic matrices. The dual program is equally easy to describe. This is a minimum problem with one variable ui for each row and one variable vj for each column. And here we want to minimize the sum of the ui plus the sum of the vj subject to merely ui plus vj being greater than or equal to rij for all i and j. I'll often use in this lecture a matrix W, whose entries wij are equal to ui plus vj minus rij. And so stated in this way, the wij have to be non-negative. Now, I knew all of these things in 1953 in the summer. And you have to imagine my surprise when I encountered the following theorem in a classic book on graph theory published by Danis Koenig in 1936. I was reading a German version which was published in the United States by the Alien Custodian Act. The book was not translated into English until 1990, which is amazing to me. Well, the theorem that I read in his book was the following. For a graph G, let M be the minimal number of vertices with the property that every edge of the graph ends in one of these vertices. And let <clears throat> n be the maximal number of edges you can choose, no two having a common endpoint. If g is a bipartite graph, then m equals n. You'll recall a bartite, bipartite graph is a graph in which all the vertices can be partitioned into two sets, and every edge goes from the first set to the second set. Now, a bipartite graph can be represented by a matrix in which the vertices of one set are the rows and the vertices of the other set are the columns. And we'll enter a 1 if an edge goes from vertex i to vertex j in the position ij. Then we have a restatement of Koenig's theorem. Given a square matrix with entries 0 and 1, the maximum number of ones you can choose, no two in the same line, row or column, is equal to the minimum number of lines needed to cover all of the ones. I'll repeat that. The maximum number of ones you can choose with no two in the same line is equal to the minimum number of lines, rows or columns, needed to cover all the ones. This is an astonishing result. I think it's hard to time exactly when Koenig discovered it, but it was possibly as early as 1916, but it surely lectured on it in the 20s and at the end of the 20s. First of all, it's an example of a linear programming duality proved decades before Danzig formulated linear programming. It's also the first example of a problem in combinatorial optimization that was solved by Koenig with a constructive algorithm that was polynomial, a good algorithm. So you can understand my excitement when I went back to my college, Bryn Mawr College, at the end of the summer, knowing that all one had to do 
was to reduce the general assignment problem to a sequence of zero one problems. You had a good algorithm for solving zero one problems, but how should we reduce the general problem to the problem that Koenig had given a good solution for? But before I tell you the rest of the story, I must tell you who was Danis Koenig and a bit about his life. First, I shall teach you how to spell Koenig's name correctly, something that's seldom done in the literature. The diacritical mark over the O in Koenig is not an umlaut. It's not two periods. It's the Hungarian double acute sign. And this is a letter from Danis Koenig saying, this is how I spell my name. I spell it with a double acute not a umlaut. Here's a picture of him as a young man. He was born in Budapest on September 21st, 1884, to a family of Jewish origin, but he was baptized as a Christian, which becomes important later in the story. His father, Gula, or Julius, Koenig was an important mathematician whose influence on Hungarian mathematics lasted into the beginning of the 20th century. I think Julius is noted mainly for an incorrect proof he gave of the continuum hypothesis at one of the math congresses in the 19th century. Danis, on the other hand, was a boy prodigy winning highly competitive prizes and publishing his first book on mathematical recreations when he still was a student in a Budapest gymnasium. <clears throat> his further mathematical training was done half in Budapest and half at Göttingen, where he was introduced to topological concepts by Minkowski. Having finished his studies in 1970, he worked as a demonstrator at the Tech Polytechnical University of Budapest, which I'll abbreviate later in the lecture as BME. He remained there until his death in 1944, attaining the rank of professor in 1935. Of course, if Koenig's name is known to you at all, that's what he looked like somewhat later in age. It's very hard to find a picture of Koenig. I, I've only located two of them. This one is uh, excerpted, uh, cut out of a group photograph that was taken in Seged in 1928. Uh, I've hunted high and low and not found another available picture of Koenig. If his name is known to you at all, it's known through graph theory. Uh, the book which I was reading in 1953 was the only full book length treatment of graph theory that had appeared before Claude Berge's book in 1958. Through his lectures, Koenig inspired an entire generation of Hungarian mathematics, mathematicians to work in graph theory including Egervari, Erdős, Turan, Galai, and many others. One can see a direct line of influence from Koenig through his student Galai to his student Lovash, the current president of the International Mathematical Union, and the whole Hungarian school of combinatorics. Some sources tell of Koenig's efforts to help persecuted Jewish mathematicians. I've been able to find only one of these, but it's a moving example. In November 1941, he wrote a letter to John von Neumann on behalf of a 15-year-old boy, Peter Lax, who was leaving Hungary for America with his family. Here's a 
reproduction of the letter in Hungarian. I won't ask you to read it or to try to translate it. In the letter, he writes of the boy's extraordinary mathematical ability and says to von Neumann, I want to quote this. He says to von Neumann, it is in the common interest to further cultivate and support this extraordinary talent. In conclusion, he urges von Neumann to take him under your benevolent protection and appreciate him as a future scientist. I, I should give credit to Andras Prekop, who was sitting in the first row, for giving me a translation of that letter. In, con in writing this letter, Koenig not only demonstrated his generous humanity, but also his ability in predicting young talent. Von Neumann took the young Peter under his wing, and Lax went on to become a distinguished mathematician, winning both the Wolf and Albo Prize two years ago. The letter from Koenig to von Neumann contains another piece of information, namely his address which reads, uh, Horty Miklas, 28. Koenig lived on the busy cobblestone street that leads from the Hotel Gellert up the hill into Buda. He was named for Miklas Horty, who was the regent of Hungary from 1920 until he was arrested by the Germans in 1944. Horty Miklas was renamed Bela Bartok way after the Second World War, so that the apartment house that Koenig lived in in 1944-41 is now Bartok Bela 28, and there's a picture of it today. Actually, in preparing this lecture, uh, lecture, I discovered on the web several offers of apartments to be purchased in Bela Bartok 28, you could buy a very nice apartment in that building today. It was named Bartok Bella after the war, uh, and it's amusing that uh, when Bartok died in, 19, in New York in 1945, he included in his will that no street be named after him while there were still streets in Budapest named Hitler and Mussolini. And uh, after the war, all of those streets were renamed, and so Bartok's request was satisfied. If hunting for details about this building in which Koenig lived, I located a genealogical website that tells the story of an Alsatian couple who visited Budapest three times in the 30s. They stayed several times in a boarding house the Hadik Pensio at Horty Miklos 28, right there. In the account written by their son, it's asserted that this vast building contained the Hadik Coffee House, a famous pre-war literary cafe which was frequented by many famous people, including Arthur Kessler. The picture that appears in the website indicates to me that a mistake was made. It wasn't Horty Miklas 28, but rather 36, where the Hadik Coffee House, again, is on the ground floor. It's been renovated in recent years, and it's around the corner from where Koenig lived. Galai, whose thesis was supervised by Koenig, and who is a principal biographer of him, has written, he liked his colleagues, and he was an indispensable participant in the coffee house life of mathematicians. And so one can easily imagine Koenig taking coffee at the Hadik Coffee House, and as a bachelor, he never married, taking his meals in the cafe which was associated with it. Again, Galai has written, Koenig was a cheerful, sociable man with sparkling humor who enjoyed telling anecdotes. Here's one of them involving Koenig, which was told to me by Peter Lax. 
There's a famous German saying in English, in mathematics there is no royal way. And in German, this is in der Mathematik gibt es kein Königsweg. And someone told that to Koenig, teasing him, to which he replied, aber es gibt ein Grafenweg. Now, for the non-German speakers in the audience, I'll do a terrible thing, I'll explain the joke. Ein Grafenweg, Graf means count, an aristocratic title in German, but of course, Koenig was very accustomed to graphs, Grafenweg. The events leading up to Koenig's death are very sad and closely entwined with the history of Hungary at the end of the Second World War. German forces occupied Hungary in March of 1944 after attempts by Hungary to uh, negotiate an armistice with the Western Allies. By the end of July, nearly 440,000 Jews had been deported from the countryside to concentration camps to be killed or to labor camps where many of them died. In the beginning of 1944, or March 1944, the only substantial Jewish community left in Hungary was in Budapest. In August of 1944, Horty attempted to reach an armistice with the Soviet Union, whose troops were already on the border of Hungary. He'd begun final negotiations by mid-October when the Germans sponsored a coup d'etat. They arrested Horty and installed a new Hungarian government led by the rapidly fascist Hungarian anti-Semitic Arrow Cross Party on October 15th, 1944. Now, Koenig's parents were of Jewish origin, but he'd been baptized and therefore exempted from wearing the yellow Star of David before October 15th, when the new government went into power. The apartment house in which he lived was one which was designated a yellow star house, a mini ghetto, which was only to be lived in by Jews. Uh, the Hungarians were very practical in this matter. They didn't want to establish a central ghetto. They wanted to spread out all over the city so that in bombing, it would provide some protection to Budapest. It didn't work. According to the story told by Paul Erdős, Koenig committed suicide when he was ordered by a janitor to move out to the ghetto. He jumped from a window to his death on October 19, 1944. He was 60 years of age. The next day, the systematic drive against the Jews of Budapest by the Arrow Cross began and all of Koenig's worst fears were realized. They drove thousands of Jews down to the banks of the Danube and shot them with no purpose. We now return to the more peaceful year of 1953. As I read further in Koenig's book, I found a tantalizing footnote which says, E. Egervari, I've translated from German, E. Egervari gave a generalization of these theorems in a paper called In Mathematicae and Physicae Lapoque in 1931. It was published in Hungarian with a German abstract. These were the days before the ability of computers to do instant translations. So when I returned to Bryn Mawr in the fall, I went down the road to Haverford College and checked out a large Hungarian dictionary and large Hungarian grammar and taught myself Hungarian in two weeks and translated Egervari's paper. Although he was not interested in constructing an algorithm, 
I found to my delight that the paper contained an idea that allowed me to reduce the general assignment problem to a sequence of zero, one problems. The algorithm that resulted can be described in one page. The preparation of the problem is easily done. We're going to construct a feasible solution to the dual problem based on a very simple construction. We first choose Vj equal to the maximum entry in each column. And then we choose negative ui equal to the minimum entry in the row of the entries Vj minus Rij. This constructs a feasible solution to the dual problem in which there is a zero in every row and column of the matrix W. Remember, I told you the matrix W has entries Ui plus Vj minus Rij. Now we perform a Koenig step. That is, we choose a maximum number of zeros in Wij, no two in the same line. And we choose a set of, a minimal set of rows and columns needed to cover all the zeros. There's the same number of each. We we'll say that there are rows and S columns in the cover. If R plus S is equal to N, then we're able to choose N zeros and we have an optimal assignment. Otherwise, we perform an Egervari step, which changes the dual variables as shown. Actually, you add an amount t to each dual variable vj that's in the cover and subtract t from each row ui that is not in the cover. And t is the minimum positive entry in the area indicated by s in the slide, which is uncovered. Uh, Professor Martello told me yesterday that he, his students find the Hungarian method one of the hard, hardest algorithms they have to study. But I think it's very simple. This is the entire algorithm laid out on this single page. If the data are integers, every Egevari step reduces the objective function in the dual program by a positive integer amount. And since they're all bounded from below by any value of the primal problem, you're bound to stop. That, that's a proof of the termination of the algorithm. It's a little harder to show that it's polynomial. Monkries did this several years after I published my paper. I'm going to show you an example in a moment. But first, I want to tell you who was Yeno Argavari. It's another sad story ending in a suicide. Egervari was born in Debrecen, in April 16, 1891, and thus was six and a half years younger than Koenig. I think when I read this footnote, I had the impression that Egervari had to be Koenig's student, but they were more like colleagues, although Egervari was much influenced by Koenig's lectures in graph theory. With the exception of a student study trip to Great Britain, all of Egervari's education and all of his academic, academic career took place in Budapest. He completed his degree under the supervision of Fayer in 1914 and began a teaching career at institutions that have a strangely applied character to their names, such as the Seismological Institute and the State Industrial College. After serving as a privat docent at several institutions, he was made a full professor at the Technological University, BME. 
in 1941. After the technical university split into two parts in 1955, Egervari became head of the Department of Mathematics at, quote, the Construction Industry and Transportation Engineering Technical University. That has a very applied ring to it. And he was professor at that technical university, BME, until he was forced to retire in October 15, 1958. The bulk of Egervari's research has an applied flavor, including several papers dealing with mathematical models for suspension and chain bridges, which may have been applied. Now, oh, that's his picture. I should have had it up before. But his work on chain bridges may have been applied to the rebuilding. Oops, that's BME. I missed two slides. But this is the chain bridge after the war. And his work may have been applied to the rebuilding of the chain bridge, one of Budapest's most famous monuments. I'll show you a picture after the reconstruction. Egervari's paper of 1931 that I translated was number 11 in his bibliography. Uh, it was published when he was 40 years old, so you can see he did more applied work than he did academic publication. It was written shortly after Koenig lectured on his duality result for the matching problem and exhibits Egervari's virtuosity in matrix theory. He was 40 years old when he wrote the paper. I'm very pleased, I was very pleased when I found out that Egervari learned about the Hungarian method in 1957 and it stimulated research related to it in the last year of his life. Another picture of Egervari. The background of Egervari's suicide is this. In order to improve the financial situation of the staff and faculty of BME, the government allowed some of them to enter into contracts with industrial enterprises to solve technical and scientific problems. A certain proportion of the money that was paid for this work was distributed among the participants. This method of obtaining extra income was new for the participants and the system was not supervised carefully. It is entirely possible that some payments were made before the work was completed. And it can be that some, it may be that some of the faculty who had no previous experience in such manners were guilty of minor irregularities in the bookkeeping. Therefore, the Ministry of Education presented a general revision of the bookkeeping in 1958. They found several irregularities and inflicted an exemplary punishment on several departments. Egervari's department was among them, and his deputy professor, Victor Lovash Naj, was arrested. I've located Lovash Naj's widow, who told me that her husband was in prison on the day that their daughter was born, September 17th, 1958, and that he was sentenced to four years in prison. He served two years of the four, and so did not see his daughter for the first two years of his life, her life. And so the pressure on Egervari was intense. Several departments, including his own, were dismantled, and he was forced to retire. His assistant was in prison, and there was the prospect of a demeaning trial and the end of a distinguished academic career. 
On November 30th, 1958, Egervari committed suicide. The last evening before his death, he asked his, will, his wife for a strong sleeping pill and asked her not to disturb him. When she went to sleep, he opened his veins, he cut his wrists, and in the morning when she found him, he had lost so much blood he could not be revived. The police came, searched the flat, and confiscated many documents, including a farewell letter. Egervari's wife had read the letter and reported to friends that it said that he was afraid that he would be the subject of a show trial and for that reason committed suicide. Egervari's suicide elicited shock and disbelief among his colleagues and students that lasts to this day. Given his outstanding record and position, he was elected a full member of the Academy of Sciences in 1946, 12 years earlier. He was the winner of the Kozuth Prize, a very distinguished mathematical prize twice. And he was the co-founder of the Institute for Applied Mathematics in the Academy of Sciences. His friends and colleagues believed that he would never have been punished in the way his assistant was, and he would have escaped any serious punishment. But there followed after his suicide many years of neglect and near invisibility. There have been notable efforts in the last few years to honor Egervari and restore his reputation to a reputation that he deserves. The Hungarian Operations Research Society organized a memorial session for Egervari at their 25th annual conference and established the Eric Egervari Medal for Lifetime OR Distinguished Achievement in 2004. A statue of Egervari was erected on the campus of BME in 2006. Two parallel events took place on the 50th anniversary of his death in 2008 the first sponsored by the Italian Operations Research Society in Ischia. The second was a special memorial workshop organized by Horos and the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. The special issue of the Central European Journal of Operations Research published this year contains a selection of lectures presented at these two parallel events. I'm happy to say, while I was sitting on the stage waiting for the uh, beginning of this session, one of the editors of this journal came up and presented me with a copy of this special issue. Uh, I was able to tell her I had a slide showing the front page of the issue in the middle of the lecture. I cannot leave this brief sketch of Egervari's life without mentioning that he was an avid mountain climber. On August 19, 1920, he scaled Mount Gerlach, that's the peak of Mount Gerlach, which is the highest mountain in the Carpathian mountain range. Now it's time to see the Hungarian method again. I'm gonna show you an example. Here's a four by four ratings matrix. And we start out by setting VJ equal to the maximum in each column. At that point, the matrix W is as shown. And there are not zeros in every row. There are only zeros in the first row. I, I think I didn't make this large enough for people at some distance to see it. Can you read it a bit? A bit. Uh, so next we set the uj, uh, pardon me, the ui equal to minus one, minus one and minus two, or minus three I think it is, 
to make a zero in every row and column of W. W now has a row and a zero in every row and column. And we want to create a minimal cover, which is indicated by the two arrows. All the zeros are covered by the first row and the first column. And we make a partial assignment of the zeros by a greedy algorithm, go across, sign the first zero and mark it by an asterisk, go in the second row, and he will sign the second one. There are two assigned zeros and a cover of two. We now do an Egervari step and change the dual variables by the rule that I told you before and do another Kernig step with a cover by three rows and columns, the first two rows and the first and the last column. And we're now able to assign three zeros. Do another Egevari step, which you remember is merely looking at the uncovered entries, the minimum is one, and adding the one to every VJ not in the, in the cover, adding one to every VJ in the cover, and subtracting one for every UI not in the cover. I don't know why Martello's student thinks this is a hard algorithm. <laughs> anyway, at this point, we do another step, and lo and behold, we have four independent zeros, no two in the same line, and hence the optimal assignment is there. You, I hope you can imagine my excitement when I put the pieces together. In the fall of 1953, I solved a number of 12 by 12 assignment problems by hand with three-digit entries. And because adding and subtracting three-digit ent entries by hand takes a certain amount of time, uh, these 12 by 12 problems took me about two hours each. Uh, <clears throat> and I knew, I was convinced that the method was better than the simplex method applied to the linear program. In a later paper I wrote on the history of mathematical programming, I expressed my conviction in the following terms. This must have been one of the last times when pencil and paper could beat the largest and fastest electronic computer in the world. I also asserted that the 10 by 10 assignment problem is a linear programming problem with 100 non-negative variables and 19 constraints, and that was larger than any computer could handle a general linear program. In 1953, there was no machine in the world that had been programmed to solve a general linear program that large. Now, I've been taken to task by Sasha Schreiber in his book on combinatorial optimization. And when he wrote, if the world includes the eastern coast of the United States, there seems to be some discrepancies with the remarks about Vota, who said they were solving 10 by 10 assignment problems on the SIAC, the, the standards Eastern Automatic Computer housed in the National Bureau of Standards in Washington. Well, the fact is I didn't know that they had programmed the special simplex method for the transportation problem. I meant general linear programs. Uh, so, is, as intended, my statement is correct. Uh, if it is interpreted as nobody had solved a 10 by 10 problem on an electronic computer, then Schreiber is correct. In preparing for this lecture, uh, my good friend Saul Gass, who's well known to this audience, provided me with all of the available written material, published and unpublished, on the solution of linear programs on the SIAC. I can find nothing in them that contradicts the two statements I made before. And I will rest my case 
for the superiority of the Hungarian method over the simplex method in those days, there was a report by Ford and Fulkerson which says, the largest example tried by us was a 20 by 20 optimal assignment problem. For this example, the simplex method required well over an hour. The Hungarian method, about 30 minutes of hand computation. Obviously, they had faster hands than I did. <laughs> some people believed that the Hungarian method was some variant of the simplex method. Uh, some years ago, I won a 25 cent bet from Alan Hoffman, who had finally admitted that this was not the case. It's not a special case of the simplex method. The matter was laid to rest with a publication of a thesis of Han Joachim Schmidt in 1974. I've given you, probably you can't read it, it I didn't, it's in TypeScript. Uh, he published his thesis in 1974 and proved that the Hungarian method is a long step greatest descent method in the space of the WIJ, using as a norm the maximum absolute value of an entry in WIJ. I, I have to tell Silvano that the reference is missing in their marvelous book. They have 60, 695 references and you miss Smith. <laughs> a very important paper. <clears throat> A living tribute to Egervari is the existence of the Egervari Research Group on Combinatorial Optimization called IGRIS. Uh, it's led by Andras Frank in Budapest and associated both with the university and with the academy. This vibrant group is the greatest tribute to Egervari and continues the ideas of Egervari in Budapest today. Uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the publication of the Hungarian method, Egris organized a birthday party, uh, an international conference in Budapest celebrating the 50th anniversary of the publication of the paper. It was held at the Academy of Sciences essentially five years ago. Three months later, after this happy birthday party, I received an astonishing email from a French mathematician whose area of research is differential equations, Francois Olivier. And I've given his website there which you can Google Francois Olivier to find it. It's quite a marvelous uh, website. But in his email, he said, two years ago, you can read it with me if you can read. I, I'm probably not large enough for the people at the top of the auditorium. Two years ago, I began to study two old papers in Latin by Jacobi. They're related to a conjectural bound for the degree of a system of differential equations expressed by solving the assignment problem with a matrix Hij, where Hij is the order of variable j in equation i. Jacobi gave a polynomial algorithm to compute the bound. Then Olivier asked me, what's the relationship to the Hungarian method? Before I give you a precise answer to that question, I'm gonna answer, who was Jacobi? <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> Carl Gustav Jakob Jacobi was born in Potsdam on December 10th, 1804 to a wealthy and cultured Jewish family. Uh, the, this precocious boy was tutored by his maternal uncle 
and entered the gymnasium in Potsdam at the age of 12. But he was placed in the highest class in the gymnasium, but he sat there for four years because the university wouldn't accept a student under 16. By that time, he excelled in Greek and Latin and had explored mathematics far beyond the school curriculum. At the University of Berlin, Jacobi decided to concentrate on mathematics. He gave up Greek and Latin. He knew them very well, as well as history. Although the lectures in Berlin in mathematics that time were very elementary, he mastered the works of the leading mathematicians of his time on his own. And before he was 20, had passed his preliminary examination for Oberlehrer. This gave him permission to teach not only mathematics, but Greek and Latin to high school students and ancient and modern history to junior high school students. In spite of being a Jew, he was offered a position at a prestigious gymnasium for the following summer. But he'd already completed his PhD thesis in the university and on application began work on the habilitation immediately. 20 years old, okay. In, at this point, he became a Christian because there was no way of being a professor at a German university at that time unless you'd converted. Thus, he was able to begin a university career as privat docent at the University of Berlin at the age of 20. Although his lectures were a success, there was no opportunity for him to have a salaried position. There was none open in Berlin, and so he moved to the University of Königsberg in the spring of 1826 when he was 22. Most of you, if you know the name Jacobi at all, know it for the Jacobian, the matrix or determinant that's used in the implicit function theorem and many other areas of mathematics. But he was proficient in many fields and published prolifically. A Krella journal very commonly would have five or six papers in each issue by Jacobi. At Königsberg, he lectured for 10 hours a week. I say that to those of you who complain about lecturing for three hours a week in a manner that was unusual for the time because he lectured about his own research. People, by and large, were uh, secretive about their research. They didn't want to talk to other people until it was finished. And another important thing that he introduced, he introduced the idea of a research seminar for graduate students, something that was unheard of before his time. He married in 1831 and had five sons and three daughters by Marie Schrenk. In 19, 1843, rather, in 1843, he was uh, diagnosed with a severe case of diabetes. The doctor prescribed a trip to Italy in the hope that the mild climate would improve his health. Uh, that is the classic picture of Jacobi. And this is a portrait that was painted of Jacobi when he was in Rome that I borrowed from Olivier's website. Returning to Prussia, Jacobi lectured occasionally at the University of Berlin and was supported by an allowance granted by the King of Prussia, Frederick William IV, who was king of Prussia for over 20 years. This was essential because the fortune that Jacobi had inherited from his father had disappeared in a depression that swept Europe in the 1840s. And so he was supporting by this small allowance both his wife and then seven children and his mother. I think that Depression times of Europe in the 1840s are very parallel to our conditions today. At this point, Jacobi made a serious mistake. According to E.T. Bell, and I'll put a caveat in here, E.T. Bell 
is notoriously unreliable in his history of mathematics. But E.T. Bell says that on the, on the advice of his physician, he took up politics to benefit his nervous system. That, that's a strange uh, prescription by take up politics to help your nervous situation, system. Be that as it may, there is a record of Jacobi attending a Masonic conference, a revolutionary conference in Strasbourg in 1847. And then in 1848, he ran for parliament and signed a petition asking the king to give up his powers and give them to the parliament. Not very wise. <laughs> you don't bite the hand that feeds you. Frederick William Wilhelm was naturally not pleased by this turn of events. He threatened to cut off Jacobi's allowance, but when Jacobi received an offer from Austria, Frederick Wilhelm didn't want to lose his most distinguished mathematician, so Jacobi stayed on in Berlin. His family was housed in a little town nearby by friends. One might have expected Jacobi to die of overwork, but his death was much more prosaic. Early in 1851, he contracted influenza, barely recovered, he developed smallpox and died within a week on the 18th of February, 1851. He was only 46 years of age. Jacobi was astonishing modern. He acted as if he knew someday people would create electronic computers. Uh, the name that was given to him by E.T. Bell is the great algorist, uh, the great algorithm founder, and it's very aptly deserved. And to evaluate his achievement, it's important to realize that it was made in a period in which suitable terminology and notation was not available. The term matrix was only introduced into mathematics in 1850 by Sylvester. That was a year before Jacobi died and fully 20 years after he'd done this work. How did he do it? In spite of these handicaps, it's clear that Jacobi started with two elementary and crucial observations. One, you don't change the assignment problem by adding a constant to a row, all the entries of a row. The position of the optimal assignment is not changed by adding a constant to every entry in a row. You have to choose an entry in that row, and so all you're doing is changing the value of the assignment by the amount you've added. The second observation is, if I can achieve column maxima, maxima in each column with no two in the same row, n of them, then I've solved the problem. If somehow I can manipulate the matrix to make column maxima with no two in the same row, then I've solved the problem. These are two elementary observations that don't use the mechanics of the duality of linear programming at all, and they are clearly in the back of Jacobi's mind. With these two observations, here's Jacobi's method on one page. We start out by underlining all of the column maxima in each of the columns. It may be that in some rows there is not a column maxima. In that case, we add a constant to that row so as to create a column maxima in that row. This is the preparation of the problem in which we have created a column maximum in each row and column. We now perform a Koenig step. Amazingly enough, he does a Koenig step. He doesn't do it as well as Koenig, and it's very hard to interpret it's messy notation, but it's a Koenig step. He constructs with the underlined elements, the column maxima, playing the role of the zeros in the Hungarian method. 
We're going to choose uh, underline method in every column with no two in the same row. We're done. That was my second Jacobi observation. Otherwise, we perform a Jacobi version of the Egravari step. <clears throat> there are no column maxima in the region indicated by the letter capital S. Find the minimum number T to add to these entries to create a new column maximum and add it to all entries in rows not in the cover. That's the Jacobi Egervari step. And now you repeat a Koenig step. To show you that this is essentially the same as the Hungarian method, let's solve the example and compare the results. First thing we do is we underline all the column maxima. Second thing we do is we add one, <clears throat> and one, one, and three to rows two, three, and four to create column maxima in these rows. And all of these column maxima end up in the last column. Now we construct a Koenig, by Koenig, a cover. Again, the first, first row and last column, indicated by arrows, and choose a maximum number of column maxima, no two in the same line. Maximum number of underlined elements, no two in the same line. Now we perform a Koenig step by, uh, pardon me, a Negavari, Jacobi Negavari step by adding one to the rows not in the previous cover performed a Koenig step, and again, we get a complete set of four underlined elements, no two in the same row or column, and we've solved the problem. Let's look at the methods side by side. On the left, in the middle of the column, look at the patterns of zeros, and on the right, look at the pattern of underlined elements they are exactly the same. And since we've performed the same Koenig steps, the covers are the same at each stage. In short, I verified, not in a very formal way, Jacobi found the Hungarian method a hundred years before I did. <laughs> now, I have to tell you a little private story. In, after Olivier sent me this email, we were going off to vacation in the Caribbean, and so I took uh, the papers of Jacobi along with me, a great accompaniment for a vacation in the Caribbean. And in these papers is a seven by seven example that Jacobi solved. And I verified there, solving it by the Hungarian method, I had the same patterns again. I've only understood the method even better in the meantime. The papers are very hard to read. The Hungarian method was not the only modern computer algorithm that Jacobi anticipated. In 1846, he formulated an algorithm for finding the eigenvalues of real symmetric matrices in order to show these values are real. Over a hundred years later, on the arrival of automatic computation, Goldstein, Murray, and von Neumann rediscovered Jacobi's method. I don't think they were as generous about ascribing it to Jacobi as I've been in ascribing the Hungarian method to Jacobi. It took them nine years before they published a paper in which Jacobi's name was mentioned at all. It was known to many numerical analysts. Jacobi's uh, original paper is called Ein Leichtes Verfahrung, that is, an easy method, and it is. I think the article on his method for finding eigenvalues of real symmetric matrices is a beautiful example of applied mathematics, and every student who knows how to read German should read it today. It's illuminating, I believe, to explore 
the motivations of each of the actors in this story. Jacoby was attempting to establish a bound on the degree of a system of differential equations. And in doing so, he discovered the mathematical pro problem we call the assignment problem. The fact that he discovered a good algorithm for calculating the bound is thoroughly modern and out of context in the 19th century. Koenig was investigating the problem of maximum matching. That is the problem of finding the largest number of edges in a graph with no two edges having the same vertex. He was interested in the general problem, but he realized in this special case of a bipartite graph, he had a duality result. That again is out of time, discovering a duality result before we'd formulated the theory of duality. Egervari, as an expert in matrices, generalized Koenig's result. That was his main motivation, to generalize the zero, one result to arbitrary real matrices. Well, I, arriving with the weapons of linear programming, duality at the beginning of the computer revolution, realized that there was latent in Koenig and Egervari's work for a good algorithm for the assignment problem that could be programmed for the then early electronic computers. What conclusion can be drawn from this story of this sorry, discovery and rediscovery of the assignment problem? Uh, <clears throat> I think there are two conclusions that are rather obvious. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, I've told you the story of the three others and not my own, but I think they illustrate very clearly that mathematicians are human beings and live complicated human lives in the context of the countries and the times that they live in. The second con conclusion that I would draw is that mathematics is independent of the social and political factors of the time in which it's discovered. Prussian monarchy, Germans, Russians, post-war America are very different places. But in all of them, good mathematics is lying out there, waiting to be discovered and discovered and discovered again. <laughs> I'd like to conclude with a slide thanking all the people who helped me in the preparation of this lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much for this example of uh, depth and clarity. Also, thank you for the higher level commercial I could ever hope, <laughs> even if one missed the reference. <laughs> we have time for questions, if any. Is there any hope that already the ancient Greeks have discovered the Hungarian method? <laughs> <laughs> Would you repeat that? <laughs> okay, again. Just Is there any hope that already the ancient Greeks discovered the Hungarian method? I don't know the answer. I really don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Other questions? I'm sorry. Or jokes.
Okay, no other questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.